Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to today's edition of Talking About Innovation. And today we're going to be talking about additive manufacturing and specifically for additive manufacturing in industry. Uh, my name is Matthew Laske, and I'm really pleased to be able to introduce two guests today. Um, they're both experts in their field, um, slightly different areas of expertise, but it's still in the same context of industry and industrial uh, additive manufacturing. In particular, how do we select additive manufacturing, whether it be traditional or additive? Um, when's the best time to use it? And what are the processes we should do, uh, we should use? So I'll start off by introducing uh, our two guests. Uh, the fir first one is CEO for Caster, um, based in Israel, and I'm pleased to welcome Omar Blair. Hi, Matthew. Thanks. Thanks for the time and the opportunity. So, uh, hi, everyone. I'm Omer. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Castor, as presented. Um, I used to work for Stratasys for a lot of years. It's a big company in the 3D printing arena. In my background, I'm a mechanical engineer and I hold an MBA in entrepreneurship and innovations. They're both from Tel Aviv University, so we're all from Israel. Um, and I think um, if we'll have two minutes afterwards, I'll love to present the Castor as a, as a company, but we're a software company, 12 people, pretty small, but uh, doing business with some large uh, enterprises around the world, helping manufacturers to decide whether to prefer 3D printing over traditional manufacturing methods when it can save them time and money. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Omar. And that's exactly the point of what we're going to be talking today. It's about how do we select um, additive manufacturing either alongside or over top of traditional manufacturing and some of the innovations that your business has come up with, I think will really help for us to you know, get a good insight into how we do that. Um, so I'd also like to welcome um, Sophie Hullett-Jones uh, as a guest as well, based in England. Um, so a little bit closer to where I'm based in, in Aberdeen in Scotland. Um, but um, Sophie has got a, um, expertise again in additive manufacturing, but more on the consultancy side and with some of the larger companies and helping businesses again to identify the opportunities for additive. So welcome right. Sophie as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so yep, so for my background, I also worked for Stratasys. A lot of people in the additive manufacturing industry <laughs> seem to have that in common. Absolutely. Um, yep, so I work with companies helping them to understand where best to use additive manufacturing and how to get that into their innovation roadmap. Yeah, so I think um, that's a good point. Uh, we can probably start with you then, Sophie, asking that question was, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about additive manufacturing over the years and it's becoming a little bit more popular, a little bit more mainstream. But, you know, what, what are some of, just briefly, some of the main technologies that are being used these days? You know, it started off with sort of plastic sort of components and we know that it's gone to, you know, Formula One and aerospace. But where do you see some of those processes and different technologies today? Sure. So there's a lot of new technologies coming onto the market and there's a lot of hype around these technologies. If you look at where the numbers are, it's still, there's two big technologies that dominate. That's FDM, which is squeezing material out of a nozzle and laser sintering, which is using a laser beam to sinter polymer powder. And if you use, if you look at the utilization rates of the technologies, those two dominate by a long way, a long, long way. That said, we're starting to see a really good adoption, uh, particularly around the metals technologies, uh, with aerospace, Formula One, starting to adopt them in anger. Um, but it's really important not to mistake noise for applications, just because there's a lot of noise around these technologies. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have the same levels of adoption as, as the more established polymer technologies. Uh, so you're still, still finding the polymer ones are the most mainstream or the most popular still? Yeah, I mean, I, I work for a company called 3T, which is the UK's largest service bureau in, in the UK. And by a long way, selective laser sintering dominates. And the reason for that is that it's such a robust technology. It is as close to what you see on the screen as what you print. It's, it's, it's pretty simple to use. Right. And it can be cost effective too. Whereas with the metals, you're probably still going to have to go through a development process if you want to get a product to market with it. So there's, there's still a lot more barriers with some of the other technologies than we see with uh, the, the more established AM technologies. 
Okay, yeah, that's that's a good point. I suppose that that leads us into sort of what Oma, Oma's company does there, um, Casta. So, talking about um, the metal industry and how we select the parts, um, I think some of the software that you've got, your business has got, helps us to to select when and when not to use it, and based on some of those benefits. So, so how do you see some of those challenges then in selecting those parts, Oma? Um, yeah, so um, first, uh, as for the, the first uh, um, few sentences of, of the applications, I would say that uh, the world is shifting now from prototyping to manufacturing. So uh, it means that it's pretty much um, available out there to use uh, specifically, uh, especially uh, plastics for, for prototyping. But it's not that common to use 3D printing for end-use parts for end-use environment. Uh, the main applications in that area are either jigs, tools, fixtures, aiding tools in the production line of industrial companies that helping them build the end product, uh, either spare parts and or either really an end-use parts, aerospace, automotive, medical devices leads this world, as, as Sophie mentioned. Um, but relates to that, um, identifying an opportunity for industrial applications is a bit different than of, for prototyping, which a lot of times you can get, you, know, you can do a lot of compromises. So for industrial applications, we first start and we believe that's, uh, that's, um, that's the main criteria for for choosing the right uh, method to use in at the manufacturing, we first choose these materials, meaning that there should be a material that matched to traditional manufacturing materials in meaning of mechanical properties or material properties out there that can address the needs of the traditional manufacturing materials. Due to the fact that 3D printing is uh, usually using layers for the for and uh, 3D printing materials, so materials is the first challenge to identify such materials that matches the traditional manufacturer. The second is geometry, whether the geometry of the part can stand in the limitation of a 3D printer. Um, there are few limitations out there that you don't have in, in traditional manufacturing methods, uh, especially for uh, wall thickness or support removal. There is a support material that needs to be removed after the printing process, so it's, it's involved some limitations. And the third is financials. I mean, whether the part has a chance to be cheaper than the traditional manufacturing method. And if you're able to check those three materials, geometry and financials, there might be a chance that there is a part out there that fits 3D printing for you. I'm really glad you started with materials because that's always the one that people fall down on and it's the one that I think people come to last usually in their analysis. Yeah. It's always the one we start with if, um, if you can't make the material work you could have a serious problem particularly if you're talking about the healthcare industry for example if you've got extractables and reachables that's going to be a it's going to be a bigger stumbling block of, is whether you can deal with that or not. So, really glad to hear that was your number. I think it's also because people think about when you think about additive manufacturing, they think about fancy shapes and crazy designs and all these different weird and wonderful things you see. So the first thing you'd think of is, well, we've got some boring part. Can we make it more you know fancy, more attractive? Let's let's three D print it. But as you've both said there, the first thing you need to concentrate on is can we print it? Yeah. By the way, maybe I just comment on that. One of the ways that we've found as a good way to uh, um, to see whether the engineers out there are ready to compromise on a 3D printing material is showing them the benefits versus the compromises they need to take on the uh, mechanical properties. So maybe if it's a little uh, less strong than you expected, but it saves you 50% of the costs, then you can see compromises happening and uh, more and more manufacturers or engineers are ready to explore 3D printing once they see the benefits on the other side. 
So, so how do you demonstrate those benefits to people? You know, if they come to you and say, mm. I've got a part, can I 3D print it? Or should I stick with CNC machining? You know, what, what would be the conversation that you would have both of you, know, both of you sort of from different angles to convince right, someone so that they should or shouldn't use it? So, so we do it through software. I mean, that, that's a good question. We, we have a really good uh, UX UI that the engineers can easily understand what are the benefits and what are the um, disadvantages and they can choose what, what's their preference for the different material properties. So maybe if they're very sensitive to heat resistant but they need to compromise on, uh, on uh, costs, then they see it really uh, in front of their eyes in live in a software. We found software as, um, as a very good tool to do that. I know that consulting is another way to do that, Sophie. So um, I, I was wondering, maybe you can help us understand how to reflect that. Uh, it's really that. tough and it, it's really dependent on the customer and what the customer's drivers are. So a good example was a project that I saw where this company had worked, worked with an AM company to redesign one of their products and this AM company had done a great job. They'd halved the size, they'd reduced the weight and they presented it back and the customer went, but it doesn't, it doesn't do what we want. And actually for the customer, reducing the weight and reducing the size weren't the business drivers. They weren't interested in those. They were interested in cost down or they were interested in improved uh, performance, the way this component performed. Um, and so what had happened was there'd been a disconnect between what this age, design agency thought they were achieving and what the customer thought that they were going to get out of it. So I think it's really worth uh, spending a good bit of time when you're developing your AM strategy as a business, thinking about where do we want to go with this? And certainly when we run consultancy, that's number one. It's before we get onto the technologies, it's what are your drivers for this? And that could be component consolidation, it could be cost down, it could be uh, supply chain realignment, you name it, but you need to understand what it is and understand what impact that's going to have to your bottom line. Because if you don't understand that from the outset, you'll probably be disappointed with what you end up with. Right, I, I totally agree. We, we had a really nice case with a large company called Stanley Black & Decker, a large manufacturer in the US for tools and power tools, where the time of a lead time of a part was the main driver for using additive manufacturing and the compromise on the material was reducing the requirements from full still a very strong still to margin still which is 50 percent less strong if i'm not mistaken and although this compromise because we had an option to uh, shows them that this part can be delivered in nine days versus nine weeks. That's eight weeks save time, uh, saving in lead time. They were ready to take this, uh, this shot. And that's really resonate with what you said. In this case, accelerate time to market was the, the ticket. And that's why I was really excited when, when Matthew invited me to, to talk with you guys, because I think that ability to rapidly run through through component you know, catalogs, bombs and catalogs and work out what, what business drivers you could potentially have and then you can explore them in more detail once you've got, you know, a, a good analysis of those parts. I think it's so interesting um, and something that a lot of companies would benefit from if they could do quickly. Yeah, it's, I find when, when you talk to people about additive manufacturing, a lot of them have a good idea these days as, as what it can do, what it is but they don't really understand necessarily how it can benefit them. So I think that, you know, having that software option of here's my assembly and here's 30 parts to my assembly, maybe not all parts are going to be suitable. Maybe some of them are, maybe some of them aren't. And to be able to drop them in there and say, right, let's analyze this part individually or this part as a system. And maybe we can, you know, combine four parts together. Um, so visualizing that rather than saying all or nothing, is that sort of part what you find with it? Yeah, no. first, just to uh, give you some flavor of the numbers, out of 30,000 parts we've analyzed, 70% of them were found as not suitable for 3D printing as is. Yeah. Only 
were found as suitable with some changes and 10% only were found as suitable as is, no redesign, okay? So maybe um, uh, to your point, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really important for the users to, to know, to, first to know this, okay? Not everything is suitable for 3D. In fact, most of it is not suitable yeah. for 3D. Uh, after you're recognizing this, <laughs> then uh, it, you, you might want to use software consultancy to identify those parts. Uh, there are a few stages of, of understanding uh, of, of this uh, technology, I would say. So, one thing I was really interested in asking you was, how do you take into consideration, say, critical is because often that can be the bit that kills you is you know you can print the whole part that face or that is it possible to take that kind of thing into consideration yet that's a very good point um we're a decision support system which means that we're not the doctors we're giving a tool for the doctors to take better decisions i mean it's hard to know all the faces and their uh, purposes just by looking at the CAD file, at the 3D object. Um, and sometimes we just recommend and it's up to the engineer whether to accept the recommendation or not. Uh, but uh, dealing with those three aspects, materials, geometry, and financials, first raising up the options for a deep dive analysis, whether there is a face out there that I can allow myself to to be used in I don't know in, in some some compromise that I that I can do on this phase. So at least we've raised up this nominee, this candidate out of thousands of hearts at once to do this deep dive analysis. The, the, the answer for your question is 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 a hard one to answer mm -hmm. with a software. Yeah. Yeah. So if you if you have a part or an assembly of parts and we've already mentioned materials is one of the most critical things to firstly understand, can you, you know, make the material that you want out of printing? But what would the process be to go through, um, you know, I've got four parts that make up an assembly. What would the process be to decide, should I or should I not use it? Um, I suppose one's from the software side and the other one's from the, the project's consulting side. I'd always start with why do you want to consolidate? What is the benefit? Is it that, so I worked on one component that's used on the outside of an aircraft, it's a metal component, um, and I think it involved 12 different welding fixtures to make this component originally consolidated down into one single printed item. So So the benefit, you've not got the labour, you've not got the resource to do that, that task. Um, and so that was, that was the driver for consolidating. If it's a pretty cheap job that you're just bolting together and it's not causing a problem for the customer in any way, then you probably don't need to consolidate it. So I think, as I said earlier, it's very much about understanding why you want to do it in the first place and then going from there. It might be that you only need to consolidate two of the components. Or yeah, same as any project business case, isn't it? Firstly, decide what is the scope and what is the driver for it, and now look at spending the time. So, and how, how about from a from a process side in that software that, that you talked about, Omar? Um, so, first, uh, the main reason that we see our customers. Um, trying to combine mobile parts into one is labor costs. I mean, the labor cost of, uh, of traditional manufacturing combine few parts into one, that's, that's, uh, that's costly. And they're, uh, they're willing to do a lot of actions to reduce those costs. And um, the, um, the interesting part of uh, identifying opportunities for parts consolidation is that the main reason why they were separated originally is because the mechanical engineer didn't thought about 3D printing as an option for manufacturing. So yeah. the traditional manufacturing method has its own limitation. This is why they were separated and combined through bolts or nuts or something. And when once you open the mind open you know open your mind for, for other options then you realize that there are there might be a better design for this. And it's interesting to see the process that engineers going through 
for uh, adopting this technology. Yeah, and that, I think you're exactly right there when you've got a design and it's not just a matter of saying, should we print this or should we man, uh, machine this or manufacture this because the design has to change for the different processes that you're choosing. And I think that a lot of the designers don't quite understand the, you know, how 3D printing or additive manufacturing actually works. You know, what are the challenges? Um, I think Sophie mentioned the other day, you know, you've got a titanium piece, half a you know, a couple of mils thick and you've got support structures on it. How do you remove those support structures without damaging the wall? Um, but that's not something you have to think about if you're machining it because you can just machine it flat. So do you think that right. that education part of the technology is still um, need to be developed? Yes, yeah, certainly. And, and when I when I told you about those components, it was it was done in the context of that was a training course we ran for some quite senior management within uh, an aerospace tier one aerospace company and um, they're never going to be running machines they're never going to pull support structures off parts they don't, they don't care but i need them to know how difficult it is how awful it will be for their employees if they're having to break these components off they need to understand the implications of their designs so i put them in the lab of an am lab for two days and got them to build failed parts and post process them and hand process them it was a very important, important learning journey for them as engineering professionals to go through those, those pain points. Um, that said, I do think there is a need in the market for automated tools such as, as the ones that Castor is developing because it's too time consuming. You cannot right. train everybody <laughs> no. to, to do all of this. You can't, um, you know, just as I can't program a CNC machine, you know, I know what a CNC machine is, I know how to work, you know, the principles, but I can't work it. And, and I think we're seeing that with, with additive. The one thing I would say though, um, we talk a lot about design for AM and all my career, 10 years in, in additive has been about design for AM. The last year for me has been about design for AM for post-processing. Um, okay. And that has just, dominated the last certainly the last six months for, for me um because we've had a big job on uh it's post-processing hundreds literally hundreds of metal am components all of which are unique all of which need machining so actually the idea of designing for am with all that freedom that you get with it and for the constraints and then having to take that back and design for conventional is a really difficult journey but it's one that everyone's going to have to go through if they want to get parts onto f1 cars or formula one or space or whatever high you know high tolerance application is going to need machining probably so that just adds a whole other layer of complexity to the conversation i, I totally agree uh with and especially first the, the only way to uh really conduct uh, an educational process is through either a personal consulting or either through a training when you go to the university learning on how to do CAD uh, and it's really the task of uh, SolidWorks Autodesk Siemens PTC to, um, to, to do this educational process um, uh, through a long run of, of uh, 10 years. Uh, we've found um, that you need to distinguish between trying to find the low hanging fruits out of an existing design for non-experts. Okay, that's a whole pipe of educational process and find opportunities or educate engineers to think redesign for additive manufacturing for experts who are looking for these benefits of the redesigns they will do. That's a whole other aspect of education and that's a little harder I would say um, so um, each of them has uh, pros and cons we rather first found them, find the low-hanging fruits shows them the show me the money shows them the uh, the benefits they get out of it and uh, for experts go through a longer process uh, of, of redesign for additive um, and I agree with you that it's uh, super challenging. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, the, the first part about learning, you know, if you want to call it an introduction to additive manufacturing is fairly straightforward. 
if you've got a background in manufacturing and machining and things, there's nothing too you know, difficult to sort of understand, but taking that right. next step from understanding what the processes are to what you, Sophie referred to as design for additive manufacturing. So designing a part specifically for the capabilities of the printers. And then there's another jump again for the expert use, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, what a lot of my customers are having to do is become very intelligent customers. So, whereas, you know, if they're ordering a, an injection mold part, they could send their design to an injection mold company, they manufacture it, and it'd probably come back exactly as they want. Whereas with additive, that customer really needs to know what they're ordering and what they're going to hold that service bureau, for example, accountable for, which means that that customer needs to know about powder control or test procedures or what test artifacts need to be on the bed, you know, and, and as a customer, they have to be driving it because the industry is quite immature. So they have to be, they have to be really confident in themselves that they can do that uh, and that they can order parts from their suppliers that are going to meet the standards that they require. And that's a big challenge for a lot of companies, I think. Would you say that, uh, that in those cases, people tend to use service bureaus for the redesign? I mean, Depends. would they mostly go for installing plus printing in a bureau, then do a simple parts and only then get themselves educated? And I think if you go back a few years, putting them, uh, but as they're kind of uh, the more hands-on engineers, the guys outside of R and D want to use AM, they're potentially having to go out and use service bureaus, and that creates whole new challenges because the innovation team then need to disseminate the information that they've learned throughout their organisation, or. The, the engineering teams need to be able to go out and get it themselves. So I think we're seeing lots of companies at that point at the moment where it's starting to spread, tentacles are going further than before. Yeah, I mean, I don't know where, if to put the, the finger on a point where the industry is shifting towards service bureaus or not, mm -hmm. or buying printers, and, and I'm not sure if there will be such a point in, in, in time, but there is uh, an important, uh, consideration to put in mind whether you want to invest your time in such a redesign process. Maybe you want to turn to a third party to help you do that. And yeah. uh, I think service bureaus are really getting better and better at this time. They're, they're experts yeah. in this. Yeah. I think it comes down to that though, doesn't it? It's about what's the capabilities of the people within your organization to one, be able to design the most efficient part and then two, to actually have this, the technologies and the facilities to print the part. Mm -hmm and then post-process the part and, and whatever else. So, you know, you might even have um, some good printing capabilities, but you might not have a, a CNC machine to then machine it afterwards. So, you know, what are the bits that your business does well, outsource the rest. And if you find there's enough volume for that, then think about buying a printer. Because, you know, like you talked about an FDM printers are one of the most popular to get a decent FDM printer. What we're talking about, what, 5,000 pounds bottom starting point for a, industrial quality one, would that be about right? I didn't catch the number. What, what about 5,000 pounds to buy a good quality sort of um, polymer sort of plastic. 5,000, I mean, if you're looking at anything industrial, which stress this sort of fortress range up, you're going to be starting around the 200,000 mark. For, for the polymer ones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, and then you're talking about metal ones again, you know, I think the, the Metal X, you know, they show some fancy videos, yeah, the Mark Forge ones where, oh, look, you can print this part and there's not even any um, post-processing needed. You know, you can take it straight out of the center and, and use it. But in reality, you, you know, you've got to print it, wash it, center it, machine it, polish it, you know, tap it, whatever you want. So I think that's where people underestimate the costs. Absolutely. I mean, the only metal parts that really have, you know, gone into use are from powder bed processes, and you need to have a mix. 
Uh, but I agree with you. I mean, the kind of uh, industrial grade companies we're dealing with are considering a processes between half a million to a million uh, dollars processes. So uh, it's um, it's a hard decision to take. To it invest. is. Big investment, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Big investment that you don't know, that a lot of companies don't know whether it's going to be um, worth its while in five, 10 years time. So even yeah. just getting finance on those machines can be a nightmare because finance answers don't know the depreciation of them. So that adds a whole other level of complexity into the business case as well, which I think is why a lot go to service bureaus. Simply financing the machines can be very difficult. So where do, where do you think that over the next three to five years, the industry is going to go? You know, do you think it's going to, um, the, the metals technology is going to really ramp up fast and then you know some of those supporting structures needed to be put in place for that or where do you see that do you want to go first <laughs> um, I, I would uh yeah thanks i, I would say this first we see now a, a nice trend of the price pair part going down because of competition either service bureaus competition or either oems 3d printing oems competition hp plays a, a large role in this game Okay, we see more and more applications are being used in 3D printing, aerospace, automotive, and, and uh, medical devices in this world. And everybody around the chase towards end-use plastics and end-use metals, which is really the purpose of the industry to go into uh, real manufacturing. But my, my point is, is in a, a different direction, and that relates to the former one about materials. What we see is an interesting trend, at least on our end, this is what we see, of materials companies who usually produce raw materials for 3D printing OEMs companies. I'm talking about BASF and BSM and Henkel and uh, Ivonic, which is uh, backing us. They have a huge approach to try to reach the end customer. Okay, so the process in anti-manufacturing in industrial manufacturing until today was that the materials company sells a material to a 3D printing OEM the 3D printing OEM purpose is to sell a printer to the end user, right? To either a B2B or a B2C. Um, and we see a, a large trend. A BASF bought a service bureau called Sculptio this year. Um, uh, Henkel uh, signed uh, a partnership with Shapeways, which is a huge service bureau, uh, New York and Eindhoven. And uh, Ivonic um, uh, did the move. Uh, using software like ours. So I think this trend of materials getting closer to the end user is really getting us closer to end use materials for end use applications. Okay. I think it's a really valid point that the, the emergence of the material players in the last few years has, has been probably the most interesting thing um, that we've yeah. seen um, because it is genuinely shifting the market. And I think it's actually really up the quality as well because there's, there's companies coming to the table who have great test facilities who you know what material should be. They, they, they come from engineering backgrounds and they have a vision for the next five years is building on that. It's just around quality. It's around, um, you know, companies releasing parts that are genuinely great quality and that have been properly validated um, and uh, and through that being able to get them into end use applications I think we've seen too many defective parts in our industry which have actually hampered the industry and you know I always say one year when I really want to cause some trouble I'm going to go around and stick red tags on parts that form next because you see parts that are shocking they shouldn't be out they shouldn't be on trade shows bands um, <laughs> because they don't if you look at them as an engineer that's not so great. I could do better conventionally. Well, why are you showing that off? <laughs> and I think we're moving away from that. You know, we, we don't see so many warped parts or shift lines or things like that. So 
I feel there is this kind of maturity. Everybody's growing up. Everybody is saying, no, we, we're, we're out of our and now and we're not going to be able to put that kind of thing on the plane. We've got to do better. And the engineers that are coming into the industry are bringing their expertise and their knowledge of S9100 or 13485 or any of these bog standard quality systems that the rest of the world operates to and putting them into AM. And I think that's really positive and it's, it's like we're, we're kind of fully maturing. Um, yeah. Um, Sophie was mentioning Formnix, by the way, uh, which is a large trade show that 3D printing has. Um, in Germany, and I think that three years ago there was only one floor for metal additive manufacturing, and last year there were two floors for metals and two or four floors for all the others, meaning software materials, printers, plastics, etc. So I think it's really resonate with the trend of going into metal metals. Yeah. Oh, very. That's really good. Um, just before I throw throw it open to anybody, if anyone else has got any questions. Um, I know Castro have um, supplied a video um, which shows the process a little bit um, on how you go through the software selection of parts and bits and pieces. I'm not going to show it um, on this live, but what I am going to do is I'm going to put this video onto the YouTube channel. Um, this side, Great. Project Engineering Management Limited, if you just type that into YouTube, there's a channel with a, a bunch of these videos. I'm going to put that video on the end of this um, discussion, so if anybody wants to watch um, that video, feel free to jump on and um, go to the end and have a look and see there. And of course, you've got um, Caster um, can answer any questions if you've got questions on that specifically. So, is there anything you want to add to that, Omar? This movie is also at 3dcaster.com. And thanks for the for this opportunity to share the the video. So. We would love to answer any type of questions and any type of level of expertise in additive. Yep. And uh, we look forward for uh, hearing from UK companies. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, if anyone's got any questions who have joined in, feel free to turn your microphone or your camera on or just type in the chat box. Um, and while well, you've got Sophie and Omar captive, we can ask them anything you like. Just if, and while anyone's thinking of any other questions, um, one last question that, that I've got is, if, if you look at the 3D additive manufacturing world, so usage throughout the world, you've got some very big American companies who you know, manufacture printers themselves and do you know, parts on that. You've got quite a, I suppose, a trend where it's going more into Europe as well a little bit. Um, where do you see the, the biggest use at the moment using additive and where do you think the, the, the next big regions are going to be in this technology? Um, so <laughs> I, should I yeah, start? Go for it, yeah. go for it. <laughs> All right, yeah, not, we, first we see uh, Germany as the leaders of end use parts applications, users for end use environment production uh, stuff. Um, uh, First Germany has a lot of uh, automotive uh, mobility, I would say in general, uh, industry which leads this world in, in how to right. explore 3D printing for and take with it some areas from uh, Japan, Korea, Singapore, because they have also large industries when it comes to uh, transportation, mobility, automotive, um, etc. And, um, and the US has been always uh, uh, an early adapter for, for new technologies. Um, I think that uh, once the Chinese market or Indian market uh, will massively enter into additive that change the game of costs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, Europe has always been very strong in AM. A, a lot of the you know, original research uh, was done was done in Europe, and we've seen great adoption through companies like Riker, for example, who have a base over in Ireland. We have 
because they don't want to talk about it. Um, so when we're not so good at talking about stuff and, and telling people what's happening. There is adoption here, but we're not good at disseminating and we're not good at, at sharing. It. Um, I agree completely that I think Asia, in particular, once it starts to really aggressively adopt this technology for things like tooling and um, you know replacing cast parts, for example, that could just just completely kind of eclipse everything that we're doing over here in terms of scale. Um, and I, I'm excited to see what comes out of, of China in the next few years. That said, we saw a presentation a couple of years ago now from the, the Chinese government on what they were doing on AM, and it did seem quite small scale in terms of their investment. So I do feel it will be driven by, um, by private companies, basically, which, uh, which will be interesting to see what happens. All right, good, thank you. And we've got one last minute question coming in the chat box. Uh, so I'll just read out um, what Lisa said. Is there a confusion in the understanding between implementing AM and buying the equipment for 3D printing? And how does our mindset have to change for that? Um, yeah, um, uh, I can give my notes on that. Uh, thanks, Liz, yep. for the question. I would say that first it's connected to the previous discussion about service bureaus and starting with a service bureau and only then get confidence and then uh, consider buying a printer. Uh, and it's a manner of volumes of what your application is really, what's the fit between your application as a user to the usage of additive manufacturing. If you found such a very unique application that 3 printing can help you with, then it's the time to consider buying uh, 3D printing. Uh, what we do uh, uh, in the software and, and that helps uh, companies do their own Excel sheet of what is the break even point versus the traditional manufacturing method yeah. is try to identify for each one of the parts what is the right break even point. And it's in, in meaning of quantities always. So, I mean, there is a break even point for all the parts. It's just a manner of whether it's a one, two, three, four parts, it's still worth using 3D printing, or is it 1,000, 5,000 parts, it's still worth using 3D printing, and above that you should do um, maybe injection molding all the way from the beginning if it's come to plastics or die casting for metals. So there is a break-even point, and each company should identify this break-even point. That's my thought of that. Mm. I think, um I think it's easy to get distracted by buying a new machine. I think if a company decides that they have an innovation project for the next 12 months, it's, they've got a budget of a million pounds, do they invest that in designing components and evaluating their supply chain or do they buy a shiny machine and set up a lab? And I think all too often companies go towards the buying a shiny lab because it's tangible, because they can, can show it off and say, this is what we're doing. Will they get the maximum benefit from that? Not always sure. I would rather see the efforts being put into really critiquing the, the supply chains that they have and understanding where it will best fit uh, and then investing, as, as Omar says, if it's the right thing to do. But if it's not, don't buy the machines because otherwise you'll just not get used and then it, it causes more headaches for you because people see it as a problem as opposed to being a solution. I'll end up like an exercise bike in the corner of your room. It's just <laughs> like that. It's a haunting <laughs> reminder. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I think that's all the questions we've got there. But um, I think we'll finish it up there. Um, that's a good point to remind us then. <laughs> go, go off into the garage and get that printer warmed up and make something. Um, thank you for everybody who joined in today. Um, it was good. We've got a good worldwide audience and a really good... Um, a number of people joining in, some good questions there. And of course, thank you to our two guests there, Omar from Caster, 3D Caster, and Sophie from Protein Advanced. It was really uh, interesting to see, you know, where the challenges are. But as you said, the opportunities are really exciting. And I think it's just going to take some people to sort of understand what those opportunities are and, you know, whether it be getting in some experts to help you or whether that's going to be software to help you streamline the processes. I think that you know, the, the choices are becoming more widely um, available and more widely accepted. So thank you both for joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks and, for um, the opportunity. And I so said if, if the video will be posted on the YouTube there, so feel free to have a look, uh, feel free to contact them. And
see you the next one. Thanks very much. Interested in a live demo? Contact us today.